We are fortunate to have with us today, John Collin, an award-winning journalist, an author, and a leading figure in the world, uh, a thought leader. John, welcome. Uh, it's nice a pleasure to, have to be here, John. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Well, the honor is ours. Your book, uh, Playing the Enemy, uh, Nelson Mandela and the Game That Made a Nation, was the basis for the 2009 film Invictus. Now, that was based on your own experience. The, the book was based living in South Africa for several years, during which time you spent a lot of time uh, with uh, Mandela, and it's the basis of envy of many of us. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, but you were good enough to record those experiences mm -hmm. and not only write that book, but there was also another book in 2008, uh, the same year that you wrote the book, Knowing Mandela. And so tonight we feel uh, particularly uh, honored to have you as we are approaching the UN uh, Nelson Mandela Day, International Day, which is a, a global call to action that uh, celebrates the idea that each person has the ability and the power to change the world for the better. So John, I want to start off by recalling my own, one of my books that I like uh, here, in addition to yours, it doesn't come as close to yours as, uh, 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 as I would like, but there is a book uh, called Let Africa Lead. It was written in 2006 by somebody you may know, Rural Koza. And Rural Koza, mm -hmm. uh, in the book, he says, amongst other things, that we all know that the greatest leader of this era lives in this country, he says, meaning South Africa. Yet, he's written no book on leadership and he's developed no manual on leadership because he is that book. And in, in, the, in the typical African idiom, you have to come close to somebody to see who that person is. And so you've had that privilege. And, so, and, and, and we want to have a discussion with you tonight about what you saw. And at the Ubuntu um, Academy, uh, Leaders Academy, we have extracted five principles or five pillars. Uh, the first of which is self-knowledge. And so I wondered if you can uh, talk to us about what you saw in Mandela, that this deep understanding of who he was and, uh, and not only a deep understanding, but, uh, but the fact is that a realization that I am because we are, and uh, and that we are not separate uh, from our community. I I know that self knowledge lies at the heart of Ubuntu, and I wondered if you can uh, tell us a bit about what you saw in Nelson Mandela as a man that knew himself. Well, uh, thank you very much, John. Um, First of all, the concept of I am as we are um, is very much incarnated in, in Mandela. Um, see, the word self-knowledge applied to Mandela is very difficult to separate from his knowledge of his people generally in the time in which he lived. So in a way, the word self there is is almost too limiting you know it just, it's it, you're talking about him alone self means one person and i think that mandela's mandela was just so much um the expression the incarnation of his people that you've got to somehow you know broaden the definition of the word self which in turn of course gets us very nicely to the idea of ubuntu of i am as as we are um because you could say 
just to play devil's advocate for a moment, that self-knowledge in terms of the private sphere of his private life, maybe he wasn't so strong on that. You know, as you know very well, his private life, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, with his, with his second wife, Winnie Mandela, um, a lot of problems with his children, you know, there he was not so adept at um, managing things in the way that he would have liked and, and things rather slipped out of his control. So I think that where Mandela's self-knowledge resides is in his status as a political leader, as the vehicle to express the desires and aspirations of his people. And I think having self-knowledge implies having a sense of one's limitations, of how far you can go in the real world. You know, they say politics is the art of the possible. And Mandela wasn't a dreamer. Well, he maybe was before he went into prison. You know, he had this notion that he was going to come to power through, like, like let me say, the Castro way, as in Cuba, you know, through force of arms. And, you know, he went to prison, and prison was a, was a tremendously valuable experience, however painful it was for him, in terms of within the, that tiny cell, within those four walls of his tiny cell, acquiring a better sense of the limitations of the possible. Um, so if you like, a greater degree of self-knowledge in terms of himself as a political leader. And he understood that the notion that they were going to sort of storm the citadel of Pretoria, um, as I say, you know, like Fidel Castro did in Cuba, wasn't going to be the way to work. If you wanted really to, A, succeed in getting rid of apartheid, B, establishing a democracy, and C, consolidating a democracy without that democracy being vulnerable to um, a counter-revolution, if you like, by the right wing, you had to operate within certain parameters. And he was quite, quite brilliant at judging that. You know, you said yourself a moment ago, John, that he didn't write the manual in leadership because he himself was the manual. Yeah. And, you know, I think that there was almost something instinctive about Mandela, almost a genius about him. You know, in the same way that Lionel Messi is a brilliant football player or Mozart was a great composer of music, Mandela was a great natural political leader. Um, he just, he just had the gift. He was in tune with the times. He could anticipate things. He had a vision that way, went way beyond just the question of being intelligent or clever or erudite. It goes way beyond that. It's a much deeper knowledge, which, yes. if we like, we can call self-knowledge. Yes. Thank you. That's, that's very powerful. I, I, to, to try and rephrase it in my own words um, what you were pointing out is that self-knowledge is not an individualistic an expression of an individualistic existence but a recognition that we are interconnected mm. and dependent with each other mm. and therefore self-knowledge has mm. fundamentally to do with the value of the collective according to a community-based understanding of self. It's not an individualistic understanding of self. Hmm. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. So, so thank you for 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 helping us understand that in a deeper way. Uh, I just want to end by saying, uh, I think uh, Nelson Mandela. I'm sure you will agree. Says that as a person, as a person, he came into the world as we all are, but he recognized very readily that he was not complete because others complete him. And so uh, his, his friends, his Ravonia trialist, his family, the country, the world is completing him. So he would be the one. Could I interrupt you one minute, John? Excuse me. Yeah. I think that, that's a very important point. And I just wanted to say something just to support what you just said. Namely yeah. that even though Mandela was born a black man, in a deeply unjust system where all the odds were stacked against black people generally. Nevertheless, he did belong to a privileged sector of that society. And he could have gone, got it on his own and done fine. You know, he, he went to university, he, he was a lawyer, 
he had his own legal practice, you know, Tambo and Mandela, him and Oliver Tambo. I mean, he could have just said, you know, why am I going to squander this relative privilege that I have, even if I'm a black man in South Africa, he was going to be able to live pretty well, make decent money. You know, he could do fine for himself. So yeah. he took the decision, the big, huge decision to sacrifice what could have been, like I say, a perfectly comfortable life within the, you know, terrible indignity of apartheid. But materially, he could have lived well enough. And he chose yeah. not to. He decided, decided to become precisely at one with his people and, you know, flow like a river with them rather than sit on the edge of the river watching the currents flow past. Yes. It was a choice. Yes. Yeah, he made a choice. He made a choice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't forced on him. Uh, if it was forced on him, it's from the, the power inside. Yeah. And the inspiration that came with that. Yeah, no, Thank the you, point John. Is, uh, can we... He, did, he had a choice. Yeah. That's the point. He had a choice. Yes. And thank you for, for that. I wonder if I can move on to another pillar, and that is self-confidence. Now, you know, I had the privilege of seeing him once or twice uh, and, and uh, close by around the same table. <clears throat> but that I can't, I can't count that as knowing Mandela like you did. Uh, but the little bit that I saw of him was enough for me to, to understand that by self-confidence, uh, he understood that to mean uh, confident without being arrogant. Uh, that he was bold, but not arrogant, uh, although he could have been at times. And I think self-confidence within the context of Ubuntu has got to do with, it's a statement of value, uh, right? A statement of value and uh, it's, uh, humility, on the other hand, has to do with a non overestimation of oneself. Uh, Self-confidence has got to do with a non-underestimation of oneself. And as you said, he had the gift of bringing those two things together in a perfect blend of humanity. Your, your view? Well, look, um, self-confidence, Mandela's self-confidence was off the charts. It's a whole new sort of dimension of self-confidence. Um, yeah just kind of it's just stratospheric you know it's up there and with the planets uh, mm -hmm. with the stars he had mm -hmm. an immense self-confidence you know he had this word that we use charisma and charisma yes. means massive self-confidence charisma means something that few people have Mandela was someone that could go into a room with I don't know 50 people that he'd never seen before and he just knew that he was going to be liked you know he didn't have insecurities of, yes. of that of the social kind at all now where does that self-confidence comes from well obviously partly you know we all have our different temperaments and we all have our different circumstances of our lives and maybe if you endured some terrible slight when you were 14 years old it could mark you for life and you're going to be insecure you know mandela mm -hmm. i think had something in his upbringing and maybe even in his genetic code that gave him a, a self-confidence. Um, but I think an important point in terms of explaining his self-confidence is that I think the secret of Mandela's self-confidence and from that, his ability to persuade, which is the essential gift of a successful politician or political leader in any circumstances, comes from his integrity. And I think integrity is an extremely important word, generally. Everybody, integrity, I think, is possibly one of you know, the quality most to be valued in people, but in particular in a leader like Mandela. And what I mean by that is that there was, a, there was an extraordinary diamond-hard coherence between the values that Mandela preached in public and his behavior in private. 
So often you hear about political leaders who will spout forth about equality and what have you, but then they treat, I don't know, their chauffeur or the waiter at the restaurant or whatever horribly, you know, in a, in a sort of contemptuous fashion. Mandela was a precise opposite. Mandela of that. Mandela was a person, his, maybe his core message was respect. Respect everybody equally. And Mandela would be equally respectful in the presence of the Queen of England or the President of the United States as he would be with, you know, the, the flight attendant on the plane or the person who, you know, washed the dishes in, 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 in his home or whatever. There was a, you know, and that's what I call integrity, that diamond hard integrity. You can't see the cracks. You, there is no hypocrisy. And I think if you behave in that way, in life generally, then that diamond hard integrity can translate into something like a diamond hard self-confidence. I think it's people who lack self-confidence and who are arrogant, as you say, it's a very important distinction. If you're arrogant, I think that the flip side of arrogant is insecurity. If you're arrogant, if you're showing off how potent, how distinguished you are, almost certainly show me an arrogant person and I will show you someone who's got some kind of in insecurities and doubts about themselves and, and moral fragilities. And Mandela didn't have that. He was the last word in self-confidence. Yes. John, um, I, uh, you may agree with me that self-confidence also has to do with courage and uh, focus. And even in the light of criticism, uh, you have enough confidence in yourself uh, and where you're going uh, to to keep you on the journey that you are pursuing. Uh, and he continued working in the interest of other people. And uh, he it wasn't on a personal mission. That's really what I would say. His, his confidence didn't lead him onto a personal mission. But... Uh, but going on a mission in the interest of the community. And, uh, and I'm sure you, you would agree with that. I can just, uh, on another matter, uh, uh, contrasting his self-confidence with his self-effacing uh, manner. Uh, and that is, uh, I, the one time I did sit with him at dinner, it was at a function, and he then was called up uh, onto the stage and the children were singing and he went behind them and he, he danced like he normally does. And then uh, when they stopped singing, uh, the program director said, you can now go forward. He says, no, I can't. He says, why not? He said, you haven't told the people who I am. You can't <laughs> assume that people know who I am. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I just like that about mm. uh, well, here. Yeah. Is yeah. If I could just cut in there on a minute. I mean, I think that in a way, is related as much to the first pillar we talked about, self-knowledge, in the yeah. sense that once Mandela came out of prison and he became this you know, huge, incredibly famous worldwide personality, he was aware of the fact that he could intimidate people, that people might not behave naturally in his company. And so he had this reflex, which he showed with you, that anecdote you're showing he had this yeah. reflex to kind of make fun of himself to bring himself yeah. down and it was kind yeah. of a way of telling the people he was with be it just one individual or be it a group look you know what i'm just another regular guy i happen to have done all these things and i'm nelson mandela but actually you know don't take me too damn seriously um <laughs> have, and so so by making a little joke you kind of lighten the mood and the people yeah. around feel less intimidated, the tension goes down, and you prepare the environment, the atmosphere, for a more easy communication. Yes. Thank you. John, can we move on to the third one? <clears throat> and that's resilience. Um, I'm sure uh, you can help us understand resilience came from, because Resilience has got to do with the ability to work through pain. And when you encounter obstacles, not to give up. And you can only really do that if the goals that you set 
are congruent with the things that you value most. And in Nelson Mandela, it was clear that that's the basis of, and the inspiration of his resilience. Would you agree? Yes, completely. I think, um, you know, let's just think of a really basic form of resilience. You know, when, when you go for a long run, if you do yeah. a marathon or something, you need resilience at the most basic sort of physical level. And what is yes. it that keeps you going, going through the pain barrier, is your conviction in the value of the objective, of, of making it to the, to the tape, to the end of the race. Um, and Mandela had that as a sort of resilience, I think, as an inborn quality, quite aside from politics, because talking of running, you know, when he was a younger man, before he went to prison, he was a boxer. And he'd go running every day from his house in Soweto to the gym, and he'd get up at about 3.30 or 4 in the morning to go running. You know, so he had a sort of physical resilience right there. And then, of course, yes. the real test of his resilience was, was in prison. You know, you're, you're condemned to a life sentence, and then you get sent down to this island off the Cape Town coast, and you're told, basically, the key's been thrown away, and you're going to be here till you die. Now, yeah. keep on going despite that, and to have already, very soon after he entered prison, started to prepare the terrain for the day when mm. he believed he would come out, and he would not this time by force of arms, but through dialogue, through negotiation, end apartheid and establish democracy. To have that faith is the critical prerequisite, which is exactly the point you just made, John, the critical prerequisite to then have that resilience, that endurance, that capacity to keep going. Your absolute conviction that the yes. goal to which you strive is a, a, a goal of immense value, so much value that you're going to you know, persist in it, come what may. Yes. There were those that went to prison with him. I don't mean the Rivonia trialists, but there were others during the same period who gave up. And I can't blame them. Uh, I mm -hmm. wouldn't have been able to withstand mm -hmm. some of the uh, atrocities that were perpetrated there. But we do live in a low commitment world. And, you know, the resilience has got to do with a deep sense of commitment mm. of where you want to go. And exactly. it's the one thing that I really admire about Madiba. Mm. Mm. No, that's In right. The, you, know, yeah. and, you know, the thing is, we're mentioning, we're going through these pillars individually, but one feeds off the other, self-knowledge, self-confidence, resilience. They're all, you know, bound together. You can't really, I mean, we're separating them I and it's useful as an exercise, but in a yeah. way, if you don't have them all, then sure. you're not going to be the complete, you know, performer <laughs> yeah. that, that we're looking for here. And yeah. you know, he had he had people close to him who shared his political goals who doubted him. You know, yes. in prison, he was he did things like he learned the language of the oppressor, Afrikaans. He learned, yeah. he studied, he read books on Africana history. And his fellow political prisoners said, what the hell are you doing? You know, you're, you're going soft. And he said, no, 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 you leave me alone. I have my plan. And of course, he was preparing the way. He's getting to know his enemy, the better to combat him on, on the field of negotiations when the time came. And then also when he was out of prison and, you know, before democracy, there were people who wondered, why are you reaching out and trying to make peace and dialogue with these extreme right, vile Afrikaners, all they want to do is destroy us. And again, yeah. he'd say, quiet, you know, I've got my plan. Let me just get on with this. And, you know, that self-confidence, the self-knowledge, the resilience, they're all there, you know, piled in together. The point that you just raised reminded me that he, he himself saw, he saw himself as a bridge builder uh, and building bridges between uh, himself and his community and people that were unlikely candidates uh, on the other side of the bridge. Uh, I don't know where he got that vision from, um, but as he said himself, it always seems impossible until it's done. And uh, I, I think I think the concept of, of Ubuntu has to include everybody, even those yeah. with whom you have, you know, major political differences. I mean, I think one thing that Mandela understood very well, and it came across in things that he said and things that he did, 
was he understood that it's it is after all circumstances of life over which you don't have too much control that determine what kind of uh, what kind of political allegiances you have you know yes. so mandela was born a black man in south africa and then the apartheid system came along but mandela understood that he'd been born a white man an africana on a farm in the northern transvaal then it was pretty damn difficult that he wasn't going to be you know a racist and everything else and he, he understood that there was that element of circumstances in, in in life that leads people down one path or another but what he also understood is that below those circumstances there is some element of goodness and some desire to reach out and some element of ubuntu in everybody and so he, he did that so he would he would talk and and the dialogue with people who were on the on the surface you know his bitterest enemies not just on the surface but he kind of he dug he sort of went into their hearts and started digging 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 until he found that common humanity the ubuntu factor and then yes. he built the bridge that's wonderful you know he uh, as as uh, <clears throat> as an example of his resilience i quoted the other day from his book the long walk to freedom where he said i have walked that long road to freedom I've tried not to falter, but I've made missteps along the way. I've discovered the secret, however, that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. Mm -hmm. Now, I've taken a moment here to rest, to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I've come, but I can rest only for a moment for with freedom comes responsibilities, and I dare not linger, for my long walk is not yet ended. So, you know, that, uh, that, that force, uh, that, that was the basis of his resilience, has propelled him through all the obstacles uh, and the hills and the valleys that he had gone through. Thank you, John. Uh, I, can we move on to the next one, which yes. is a, a pillar... It's called empathy. And there may be various ways of understanding empathy. And I'd like you uh, maybe to tell us um, if you can recall an incident where Mandela really showed his heart. Because uh, my own understanding of empathy is the ability to feel with others, not for others, but really feel with others uh, to uh, to share uh, their uh, dilemmas, their dilemmas, and um, and not only being driven by head and hands, but by your heart. Hmm. Well, I mean, for me, empathy means an ability to put yourself in the other person's shoes, hmm. be able to yeah. feel, to imagine, and to feel, and to have a real sense of what the person that you're talking to. Um, is all about what makes them tick. You know, I um, I was present at Mandela's first press conference on the day after his release. And I asked him a question. I said, what's going to be, you know, you're now planning on embarking on negotiations, which at that time seemed a very, very implausible prospect. There didn't seem to be any notion that the white government was going to voluntarily, you know, be persuaded to, to relinquish power. And so I asked him in the press conference, what's going to be the plan? And his answer was, we have to reconcile black aspirations with white fears. Hmm. So already in a big picture way, he understood that the real essence of, or the motor behind the apartheid system and the reason why he was feared at that time, just after his release by by white people well was it was about fear it was about that was the essential feeling was fear that what's going to happen to us now so in that sense he was able to put himself in the shoes of white people right from the beginning and so he went out of his way always really but even from the beginning to show to sort of stage almost in a theatrical kind of way that he was not someone who white people should fear but actually someone who wanted to be white people's friends. And that on the day when he became president, 
he was going to be an equal opportunity president in the sense that he was going to care not just for black South Africans, he was going to be a president for all South Africans and try and do, you know, work for the common good. Now, that might mean, you know, doing a little bit of displacing of privilege and everything, but nevertheless. And so, you know, so for example, I'm talking about immediately after his release, I'm talking about his first press conference, which is the most amazing press conference out of hundreds that I've been to in my life. And what happened during that press conference, in which there were about 200 journalists from all over the world, was that those of us who asked questions, and only about 10 people asked questions, had to identify themselves by their name and by their medium. So I was there representing the Independent of London, and someone from the BBC asked someone, someone from CBS America. And then this guy lifts up his hand and says he works for Die Burger, which, as you know, is an Africana and at the time deeply conservative newspaper that thought it was a really bad idea to have let Mandela out of prison. And so this guy, with a certain courage, it must be said, identified himself as the political editor of Die Burger and asked a question. And Mandela, no, sorry, when the guy identifies himself, before Mandela answers, there's a kind of sharp intake of breath. Like, oh, my God, Mandela just come out of prison. How's he going to respond to this guy who is the very incarnation of the enemy? And Mandela's response is to break out into a big smile and say, I can't remember the guy's name. Let's say it was Heldon Hayes. Mr. Yeah. Heldon Hayes, what an immense pleasure to meet you in the flesh. I've been reading you with great interest for many years now. <laughs> so right there, it's, it's, it, this goes beyond an interaction between him and this guy, Heldon Hayes. It's a yes. way of conveying a message through that press conference, which a whole country is watching, that you know he doesn't have horns, he's not going to go and you know, draw blood and bite. He's actually a human being with a sense of humor and who has a, he's, he's already trying to, you know, relax things and make things easy with that journalist and through that journalist to white South Africans as a whole. And that anecdote, yeah. I could spend the whole night here giving you anecdotes of that kind. But even, even after he achieved his goal and after he became president, he continually made these kind of gestures, kind of theatrical gestures. He was aware of the power of symbolism towards um, white people in particular, but also towards his own black enemies, such as Mangasudu Butelezi, who was actually just as much of a danger for him at the end as any anyone in the white establishment. And he also reached out to Mangasudu Butelezi and other people you know, within the black community that were his political rivals. And so, you know, and he understood where they were coming from. He understood their fears. He understood, as I was saying a minute ago, that it's also circumstances of life that lead you down a particular political path. And so you try to go beyond that to the human being within. Um, again, empathy, Mandela had it, um, had bucket loads of it. Wow. Yeah, so, the, I mean, the, uh, at the end, I want to ask you a question related to that. And that is whether you think uh, some of us can emulate that. But let's let's move on quickly to the last pillar, which is the pillar of service. And uh, so I'll ask you a question. Do you think Mandela fitted the description of a servant leader, one that serves? And if so, why do you believe that? Well, um, completely. And again, I'll repeat what I've said before, that it's very difficult to um, put any of these five pillars in isolation because one feeds off the other. They all just nourish each other. And, um, you know, if if the five pillars aren't there, then if there's just four, they're liable to fall down. Yes. Um, and so the sense of service, well, that just comes back to what I was saying before. He had a choice. He was you know, among black South Africans, it sounds a weird thing to say, but he was nevertheless, he belonged to a, a privileged few. And he decided that rather than serve himself as a lawyer and make a decent living for himself, he was going to make it his life's business to serve his people. And in choosing to do that, he had he made the most difficult decision of his life, which is to serve the national family over his own biological family. You know, his wife, his kids, they were going to suffer as a consequence of the huge choice that he made to serve 
the nation as a whole, the great faceless nation, you know, without faces and names. You know, his family had faces and names. And by the choice that he made, he was condemning not just himself, but his family to a life of, of great difficulty, as was shown to be the case after he left prison, because Winnie and the children suffered a lot. Um, and so, you know, the notion of, 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 of service, of public service, is absolutely fundamental to an understanding of Mandela. You know, he said it in his speeches, I, the servant of the people. He said that when he became president. Um, he was the absolute polar opposite of that classic corrupt leader who's just there in it for himself, who's there to boost his ego, who's a narcissist. Um, he, he is, if you like, I can't imagine any political leader who is more the polar opposite of Donald Trump yeah. than Nelson Mandela. You know, Nelson Mandela wasn't there, you know, to boost his own ego. He was there chiefly as the servant of the people. Yes. And you've seen that. Would you, would you agree with me that to be a servant truly and to be a leader seems to be a, a, a paradoxical statement. Uh, it's a paradox uh, that Mandela uh, lived out uh, because when I block out the leader part of who he was, I can see him as a servant. And when I block out that other part, I see him as a leader. And yet, when I stand back, I see a perfect blend, a fusion of service and leadership in Nelson Mandela. Mm. And I, I do think that uh, he uniquely showed that it is not possible to serve people unless you care for them. Because I think there is an enduring suspicion that uh, politicians, as powerful as they may be, or as intelligent as they may be, there's an enduring suspicion that the that the values that they espouse and mouth are not really coming from their heart. Mandela actually uh, could, could speak to a range of people, uh, uh, one hand speak to world leaders and the other hand hug, hug a person in the street, equally genuinely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I think that... Um, you know, again, we come back to this word I used before, integrity. You know, these doubts that people may have about politicians, as you say, whether they're mouthing stuff or not really, you know, having their heart behind it. You know, Mandela proved um, the substance and the integrity of what he said to me, and that's where, that's where, I, that's where I had the privilege of, of knowing him, that I could see him in the private sphere, you know, be, behave in a matter that was absolutely congruent with the message fundamentally the message of respect that he preached. It's a message of respect from everything else that flows. But I like the point that you make, John, about this, this riddle or this paradox between servant and leader. I mean, it's, it's an interesting one. And we can get into a whole sort of, you know, philosophical tangle if we go down that road too much. Um, yeah. But I mean, it's true because, I mean, as a leader, you have to have that self-confidence. You have to have that certainty that you know, the path that you want to lead your people down is the correct path. And there, you know, the people are going to follow you. So in a way, the, the, the people there are your servants. But at the same time, you're doing that out of an absolute conviction that it is um, what you're doing, what you're proposing is absolutely uh, in the best interest of the people. And therefore, you are serving them too. But it's, but it's an interesting little sort of riddle there. Um, Thanks, right that you've raised. Yeah. John, as we close, and I wish we could go on forever because you you such a, uh, had such a wealth of understanding and experience, not only about Nelson Mandela, but about world leadership. But, you know, I was sitting in the U.S. when Mandela walked out of prison, and I was filled with anger and uh, deep determination. I never want to go back to South Africa. Hmm. And, uh, and when I saw Nelson Mandela walk out of prison and I heard him say things that he said when he went in, that South Africa belongs to all the people, 
that I saw a, a distinct absence of malice and of revenge. I saw Ubuntu. I decided to come back to South Africa, and I did come back at the end of 1990. But I still, until today, wondered. The aspiration that I had is I want to, somebody wrote the book, Leading Like Mandela. Well, be in some way like Mandela. And the question I wanted to ask you on as we approach Mandela Day, which, as I said at the beginning, is premised on the belief that we can also do things that Mandela did. But do you really honestly believe that he is a once-off hmm. human being? And that, uh, that, or do you really believe that we can emulate him in, in, in a, a, a way that maybe you can help us understand? Because I know I can not be Nelson Mandela. I can, but I know that I have a story and I have to own my own story with all its own brokenness and its own commitments. Uh, but I, I never would like to compare myself with Mandela. And although he inspired me to be like him, I wondered if that's possible. Will we ever see another Nelson Mandela? Well, ever is a, is a long time, John. <laughs> Um, so I don't know about ever, um, but I think that, um, you know, he, he sets, he's the measure, he's the measure of the great leader. He is, you know, certainly in my experience and I've been around, you know, I haven't just been in South Africa. I've been to a lot of countries and I've written about a lot of places and lots of conflicts and, and I've never seen anyone remotely of his stature. And I think that I do think he's an, he is or was in, in a class of his own. You know, I talked before about, um, you know, music and football, you know, Lionel Messi football, Mozart music. I mean, that, that's Mandela with politics. But at the same time, I think that there is, a, there is a nobility and a value in seeking to emulate him, to, to try and follow his basic, you know, these five pillars that we mentioned here, you know, kind of glued together, perhaps, by that word that I mentioned, the word integrity, and also by the word respect. I think those are two terribly important words when you think about Mandela, too. Um, you see, one thing that made me particularly attached to South Africa, which is a country to which I will always feel most attached, even though I have no family connections there, or, you know, I only went there when I was about, um, you know, 30 six or something like that. I never, I knew nothing about South Africa. But the thing is that I found, and I think this is the key point, and I've said this before to friends, I found so many mini Mandelas in South Africa. I mean, that was the beauty of it, that there were just so many extraordinarily fine people yes. who had really the essential Mandela qualities of integrity, respect, generosity. Yes. They met them all the time. People who've never ever made it into a newspaper and certainly not, you know, very far from becoming world famous or even famous in South Africa. But I'd go to a little township in the Orange Free State or I'd go to some, I don't know, not just even that, maybe a farm, an Africana. Um, and, and I'd find, you know, those qualities there, that, that kindness, that generosity, that sense of service, the empathy, the resilience, the self-knowledge, the self-confidence, the sense of service. I saw that in people. Now, the thing is, Mandela had a special talent. I mean, and, and I think, you know, we have to accept that as in all spheres, football, music, painting, whatever, there are people who just have some God-given gift that other people don't have. And Mandela just combined everything. And he had that enormous charisma, that vast self-confidence to a degree which is very difficult to find in ordinary people, that vast self-confidence and that immense charm, which is also goes hand in hand with, with self-confidence and charisma. You know, he kind of... He kind of had it all. You know, we, we mentioned the five pillars. He had 10 out of 10. He had 100% in each one. Now, most of us can only, you know, hope to get, you know, 60% in one, 70% in the other. But at least you try. And I think yeah. by trying to emulate um, yes. what he did and his values and his talents, if more people did that in the world, the world would certainly be a far better place than it is right now. Indeed. He certainly surprised me many times, in particular, 
in your book um, about playing the enemy. Um, you know, I when I remember in 1995, I saw him on the rugby field and I, I wondered what is he trying to accomplish? <laughs> and then I realized that you used the word hope and that we all hope for a better world and a better South Africa. But hope is not a strategy. You have to develop a strategy. Hope is exactly. not one of them. And, and, and maybe the five pillars is a place to start building a strategy. And you've mm. helped me certainly understand that in a deeper way, John. What a privilege to have you and have this conversation with you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's, a pleasure. it's an absolute pleasure, John. It's wonderful to be with you. Thank you. All the best.